What the hits? Forget. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30 minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners. So we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases, especially written, for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Dan Friedel. And Brian Lynn. Later, Steve Ember will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first, here is Dan Friedel. Scientists in Guatemala believe they have found the earliest example of the Mayan calendar inside the remains of an ancient building. The archaeologists found pictures called glyphs from a Mayan pyramid. The glyph represents the day called Seven Deer. It is one of 260 days with special names in the Mayan calendar. The researchers believe the glyph is over 2,200 years old. It shows the Mayan writing for the number seven. Above a picture of an animal called a deer. The picture came from a wall painting inside the pyramid known as Las Pinturas. It is in San Bartolo, an ancient Mayan place that became famous in 2001 when archaeologists found a buried room that contained colorful wall paintings or murals. Those murals are thought to be about 2,100 years old. They show images of ceremonies and the ancient stories of the Mayan people. The deer glyph came from the same Las Pinturas pyramid, but it is older. Researchers believe the Mayans built smaller religious structures and then built the pyramids on top of them. David Stewart is a professor of Central American art and writing from the University of Texas. He wrote about the discovery in the publication Science Advances. He said the pieces from the mural fit in your hand, but they were once attached to a stone wall. He said the wall was torn down when the ancient workers were building the newer space that became the pyramid. He said the paintings from the older period are all broken up, unlike the newer murals found in 2001. Until the discovery, the oldest known example of the Mayan calendar came from about 2,100 years ago. The calendar is thought to be one of the top achievements of Mayan culture. It followed the movement of the sun, moon, and planets and was based on a 260 day cycle. The Mayans also counted time based on the sun and considered one year to be 365 days. There was also a system based on the moon. The Mayans had a system of 800 glyphs. The earliest examples come from San Bartolo in the forest of northern Guatemala. The place was important to early Mayan society for over 600 years, until about 1,800 years ago. About 7,000 mural pieces have been found at San Bartolo. Some are as small as a fingernail, and others are over 400 square centimeters. Heather Hurst of Skidmore College in New York State is a co writer of the study. She called the pieces a giant jigsaw puzzle. The notation of seven deer and other calendar glyphs are shown on 11 mural pieces from San Bartolo. Researchers say that means the calendar was in use for a long time before the murals were built. 
As a result, Hearst believes older examples of glyphs from the calendar might be found in other places. Hearst said, The culture's well-established tradition of writing and art shown on the mural pieces was impressive. Some Mayan communities still use the ancient calendar. Stewart said the calendar has been used for at least 2,200 years, even during times of incredible change, stress, and tragedy. I'm Dan Friedel. South Koreans may soon become at least one year younger in age. Yoon suk Yeol is set to become the country's next president next month. He has promised to end the country's special method of calculating age. In the Korean system, all babies are already one year old the day they are born and get a year older every January 1st. That means a child born December 31st would turn two years old the next day. This traditional method of age calculation was once widely used across East Asia, but other countries long ago changed to the more internationally accepted system. It is not fully known how the traditional method developed. One theory says the system is meant to recognize the life of a fetus. Others say the system comes from ancient numerical systems that did not include the idea of zero. South Korea in the past has attempted to move away from the traditional way of calculating age, but those efforts often led to misunderstandings. As a result, South Korea now has three methods for calculating age. South Koreans must learn for themselves what method relates to which law or administrative process. Since the 1960s, South Korean official documents and laws have used the international system, in which babies are born at age zero and add a year every birthday. However, in social settings, many South Koreans continued to calculate their age using the traditional method. There is also the so-called year-age method, in which babies are born at zero and gain a year every January 1st. This method is used to decide school grades and when males must perform their required military service. According to a January public opinion study by Hankook Research, 71% of South Koreans support ending the traditional age system. Those born later in the year often feel left behind, especially as children. That is because they are placed into classes at school with much older, more advanced students. This can add even more pressure to South Korea's highly competitive school environment. Lee Yun chul helps run an eatery in the northeastern province of Gangwon. She said her son, who is nine years old according to the traditional system, is seen as a slow learner at school. But he's not actually slow, she said. He was just born later in October compared to the other kids in his year-age group. For Korean males, those who are born later in the year must complete their required military service many months earlier than others. Although the difference may seem small, it can affect important education or job-related decisions. Most recently, many South Koreans became frustrated after health officials used differing age standards for coronavirus vaccinations. As a result, many people were required to show proof of vaccination even though they were in an age group that could not yet get vaccinated. Yoon made ending the Korean age system a major campaign promise. 
Under Yoon's proposal, international age would become the single standard for all legal and social purposes in South Korea. The effort would likely take some time to put in place. Though similar attempts have failed in the past, experts say Yoon's proposal may succeed. The experts note the change has support among both major political parties as well as the South Korean public. Major car makers are looking to expand the production and sales of electric vehicles in the coming years. They are also seeking new ways to reuse batteries to cut costs and protect the environment. Lithium ion batteries are used to power most EVs. Manufacturers guarantee their batteries for eight to ten years. Currently, few batteries are recycled, meaning their materials are reused. Current recycling processes are difficult and costly. Among the necessary materials used to make lithium ion batteries are lithium, cobalt, nickel, graphite, and manganese. Better recycling methods could help solve problems related to the limited availability and rising costs of these materials. Most recycling methods under development involve breaking the batteries down into smaller pieces. Then different processes are used to separate the metallic elements. The goal is to reuse as much material as possible. The International Energy Agency released a report about the development of the EV market in 2020. The IEA noted that in most cases, the main elements of end-of-life EV battery systems can be repurposed or used in a new way. In addition, the IEA said used batteries that still hold between 70 to 80 percent of their power capacity could be reused for less demanding stationary storage. This could include using old EV batteries to store power for a main electricity system known as a grid. The report suggests recycled batteries also could be linked with systems producing electricity from wind or the sun. British researchers have experimented with methods that could fully recycle main electric battery parts such as the cathode and anode. One method uses ultrasonic waves to recycle these important elements without having to break them apart. Other researchers have studied a process called hydrometallurgy. It uses liquids and chemicals to remove lithium and other elements from used batteries for use in new ones. One of the main American businesses aiming to make EV battery recycling profitable is Nevada-based Redwood Materials. The company was started in 2019 by J.B. Straubel. He helped launch American car maker Tesla along with its chief, Elon Musk. Redwood seeks to recycle the most common EV battery materials. The company's methods include hydrometallurgy and pyrometallurgy, which uses high heat to separate the metals. The company already holds supply contracts with American carmaker Ford and Japanese electronics manufacturer 
Panasonic, which produces batteries for Tesla. Ford announced last September it was investing fifty million dollars in Redwood. I'm Brian Lynn. Welcome to the Making of a Nation: American History in VOA Special English. I'm Steve Ember. We look back at the presidential election of 1976. When Vice President Gerald Ford became president in 1974, he took office during a crisis. For the first time in American history, a president, Richard Nixon, had resigned. Nixon resigned as a result of the case known as Watergate. It involved the cover-up of illegal activities related to his re-election campaign. Lies about Watergate only added to the mistrust of Americans angry at having been misled about the war in Vietnam. After Vietnam and Watergate, many people no longer believed their public officials. Voters rejected Gerald Ford, a Republican, in the presidential election of 1976. Instead, they chose Jimmy Carter. The candidate of the Democrats. Why? One reason was that Ford had pardoned Nixon. He declared a pardon for any crimes that Nixon might have committed. This made many people angry. Also, he refused requests for federal aid for New York and other cities. Voters may have felt that he was not concerned about the problems of poor people. Others believe that unemployment and inflation defeated Gerald Ford. He was not able to deal effectively with these problems during his short presidency. There was competition for the Republican Party nomination in 1976. Ford's chief opponent was Ronald Reagan, who had just served two terms as governor of California. Democrats thought that voter anger about Watergate would help their party win the White House. Eleven Democrats campaigned for the nomination. Two well-known politicians did not campaign, but they said they would serve. If no other candidate won the party's support, they were former Vice President Hubert Humphrey and Senator Ted Kennedy. One of the lesser-known candidates was the former Governor of Georgia, Jimmy Carter. My name is Jimmy Carter, and I'm running for president. Political experts gave him little chance of winning the nomination. Most Democrats did not even know who he was. Before becoming governor, he had been a nuclear power engineer in the Navy and a peanut farmer in Georgia. Again and again, he told people that he was not part of the political establishment in Washington. He also had strong Christian beliefs. This appealed to a lot of voters. Many voters supported Carter in the primary elections leading up to the party's nominating convention. His victory in the Florida primary was especially important. He defeated another politician from the South, Governor George Wallace of Alabama. Jimmy Carter represented what was called the New South. He made it clear that he opposed the ideas of the Old South, like discrimination against blacks. George Wallace spoke of creating a better life for both blacks and whites. 
yet he had strongly defended racial separation for most of his political life. Many people remembered pictures of Governor Wallace at the University of Alabama in 1963. The pictures showed him blocking the door to prevent two young blacks from attending the school. The Republican primaries had mixed results for President Ford. Right now I predict that the American people are going to say that night, Jerry, you've done a good job. Keep right on doing it. For example, in New Hampshire, he won only 51% of the vote. Ronald Reagan won 49%. But in Massachusetts, Ford won twice as many votes as Reagan did. The campaign showed that Reagan was more conservative than Ford. For example, Reagan talked strongly about United States control of the Panama Canal. In his words, we built it, we paid for it, it's ours, and we are going to keep it. President Carter would later decide differently. Ford, in his campaign speeches, denounced extremism. It was clear that he was talking about his opponent, Ronald Reagan. Ford and Reagan won almost the same amount of support in the Republican primaries. Yet, many delegates at the nominating convention remained undecided. This was a dangerous situation for the Republican Party. Party leaders did not want a fight over undecided votes at the convention. They worried that a lack of unity could damage the party's chances in the general election. The situation was similar for the Democrats. Support for Jimmy Carter increased. But some Democrats who did not like him began to say, anybody but Carter. Carter's campaign message was that he did not have ties to special interest groups, that he would be different. I see an America that has turned away from scandals and corruption. I see an American president who governs with vigor and with vision and affirmative leadership. A president who is not isolated from our people, but a president who feels your pain and who shares your dreams. I see an America on the move again, united, its wounds healed, an America entering its third century with confidence and competence and compassion, an America that lives up to the majesty of its constitution and the simple decency of its people. This is my vision of America. I hope you share it, and I hope you will help me fight for it. Many people liked what they heard. Carter won the Democratic primaries in Georgia, Alabama, and Indiana. The other candidates fell hopelessly behind. At the party convention, he was nominated on the first vote. In his acceptance speech, he repeated the line that he continually used with voters. My name is Jimmy Carter, and I'm running for president. Carter said there was a fear that America's best years were over. He said the nation's best was still to come. Walter Mondale, a senator from Minnesota, became the party's vice presidential candidate. A month before the Republican Party convention... Ronald Reagan made a costly political mistake. He said that if he won the nomination, he would want Senator Richard Schweiker of Pennsylvania as his running mate. Conservatives got angry. Schweiker was a liberal Republican. Some political observers say this is why Reagan lost the nomination to President Ford. 
Many of the delegates wanted Reagan to then be Ford's running mate, but Reagan was not interested in becoming vice president. Instead, the nominee was Senator Robert Dole of Kansas. Nonetheless, Reagan received a long and enthusiastic response from the convention delegates when Gerald Ford motioned for him to come down and join him at the podium. If I could just take a moment and tell, I had an assignment the other day. Someone asked me to write a letter for a time capsule that is going to be opened in Los Angeles a hundred years from now. We live in a world in which the great powers have poised and aimed at each other horrible missiles of destruction, nuclear weapons that can in a matter of minutes arrive in each other's country and destroy virtually the civilized world we live in. And suddenly it dawned on me, those who would read this letter a hundred years from now will know whether those missiles were fired. They will know whether we met our challenge, whether they have the freedoms that we have known up until now will depend on what we do here. Mr. President. It was a preview of the strong and confident speaking style that would serve Reagan well four years later. Indeed, as the future president, Ronald Reagan would be known as the great communicator. The general election campaign started in September 1976. One newspaper said, the campaign left voters feeling sleepy because it was not very interesting. Ford and Carter agreed to debate each other on television. No one had done that since 1960, when Richard Nixon and John Kennedy had several televised debates. Many people thought Ford did a little better than Carter in the first debate. In the second debate, however, President Ford made a mistake. He wrongly suggested that the Soviet Union did not control Eastern Europe. I don't believe that uh, the Yugoslavians consider themselves dominated by the Soviet Union. I don't believe that the Romanians consider themselves dominated by the Soviet Union. I don't believe that the Poles consider themselves dominated by the Soviet Union. Each of those countries is independent, autonomous. It has its own territorial integrity. And the United States does not concede that those countries are under the domination of the Soviet Union. Carter responded, I would like to see Mr. Ford convince the Polish Americans and the Czech Americans and the Hungarian Americans in this country that those countries don't live under the domination and supervision of the Soviet Union behind the Iron Curtain. The third debate did not have a clear winner. Opinion polls showed that many voters were still undecided. In November, Jimmy Carter won the election. He received 51% of the popular vote. President Ford won 48%. A lot had changed in the two years since Jimmy Carter began to receive national attention. Most Americans had never heard of him before. Now, many of those same people had just elected him the 39th president of the United States. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.